listening to Metal Matters, a weekly gimme radio podcast. I'm your host, Mike Hill. If you like metal, punk, hardcore, or anything extreme, you've come to the right place. So subscribe and never miss out. Hello, everyone. I hope this finds you doing well and everyone staying safe. This week's episode features Charles Elliott of Abysmal Dawn. They have a brand new record out on Season of Mist called Phylogenesis. And Charles uh, hung out for a while, talked about the record, talked about the last several years and the difficulties and obstacles that he had to overcome to get to this point. If you like the show, please rate and review. Please share with your friends. That's all much appreciated. How... uh are you dealing with all this insanity with the coronavirus and all that stuff? Is it impacting you guys at all? Uh, yeah. I mean, we, uh, we had a tour offer right after this that we were uh, planning on, uh, doing and now it's been postponed cause it just didn't make any sense. Yeah. I mean, that's basically where we're at. I mean, day job, have to work from home. I've been, doing some mixing and stuff on the side yeah man but yeah it's it's weird like a <laughs> going into a grocery store or whatever and having to wait in line and then having a i guess like uh you know aisles pick clean of everything and yeah it's just a weird situation i guess you know yeah that's pretty uh the the whole hoarding thing is the thing that makes me uncomfortable i mean uh it's this weird hysteria that has erupted as, as a result of this. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that this isn't something to take seriously because it is, but uh, the people's reaction is um, more alarming than what's actually going on. I think sometimes. I mean, I don't, I don't think much of people, so I'm not that surprised. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I mean? to be honest, like I feel like it's, it's not as bad as it, it could be. To be, you know, um, maybe. <laughs> Maybe because I'm a pessimistic person, I'm a, and my 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 uh, standards are always low. I'm always pleasantly surprised. Like I haven't been seeing like you know riots in grocery stores or people freaking out or um, anything personally. But uh, it, it seems like for what it is, it, it's not that bad. Yeah, the hoarding thing sucks because everyone's freaked out and they think you know food's gonna be gone or there's gonna be like you're not gonna be able to go to the grocery store and feed your family because you're going to be locked in your your place on you know on in quarantine for however amount of, amount of weeks or months so i understand that it could be much worse and it could get much worse so i don't know yeah it's unfortunate because you guys have this record that's coming out like in a couple of weeks uh phylogenesis and uh it's the first record you guys have put out in like what like five or six years and um, yeah almost almost six years man yeah, and uh, the and last then, one was on Relapse. So you guys are on a brand new label. You got a brand new record, right. all that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's like a you know we've been it's taken this long to get here, and then this shit happens. So uh, yeah, I mean it's 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 fucked. But I mean it is what it is, and like uh, at least um, we were fortunate enough to do I don't know maybe like one of the last North American tours. Uh, or metal tours in the U.S., you know, or North America for for uh, quite some time because we we just got off the road with Vader, Hideous Divinity, and Vitriol, and um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, to think that was we we just slid in like right right as all these tours were being canceled, you know, got home like right at the end of it. Yeah, that was definitely good. I mean, either either way, I mean, you guys you guys. Um... It's not the worst things. You just have come off this tour, you know, people, you're in people's minds and then this record comes out and, you know, it'd be great to go right back out on tour and support the record, but it's not the worst thing because you guys just finished up this sick tour. I mean, Vader's amazing. I love that band. It could be worse, like like I was saying. Um, and, you know, like people waited a long time and they'll get the record and I don't think... I don't know. In the end, it's not going to hurt. I don't think, you know, I mean, it's, it's not ideal, but the whole, I guess, uh, business model, I feel of, you know, needing to be on tour, uh, to prove something for first week sales or something, you know, <clears throat> is just kind of going away 
and it's more of like the long game, I think, you know, and with how, you know, if we leave a lasting impression and people are still, we still have fans basically, you know, it's not, it's not going away just because we're not touring like right as the album comes out. So trying to work, look in the bright side at least. And I think, you know, there'll be a lot of bands that want to tour and we'll be one of them once this is all cleared. It's just going to be weird because everyone's going to want to tour around the same time, you know? Um, so we'll see what happens with that. But I think people might be so excited to hear new music or hear and see music again live. It might not that be that big of a deal. Yeah, I kind of feel like that might be the case that once things straighten out that people are just going to be so stoked to be able to go out and do things, you know, and maybe that's what part of this whole thing is about. I mean, you know, people have gotten spoiled and complacent when it comes to leaving their houses. You know, everyone wants to stay home and order food and be on Netflix and, you know, not really connect with the world. And now that you're forced to stay indoors, maybe they're appreciating that more, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking yeah. about, you know? Yeah. Maybe people miss and really cherish real human react or interactions again. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. Most of your career actually was on relapse. And uh, like I was mentioned earlier, Obsolescence came out uh, almost six years ago. And now this new record is on Season of Mist. So uh, did you guys just finish your, your contract with Relapse and move on? And, you know, was uh, what, what was the story behind changing labels? Yeah, basically we reached our end of uh, the, the end of our deal with Relapse. Um, we had a couple other options after that. And uh, <clears throat> speaking with... Season of Mist, I don't know, it just seemed like a right fit. Like, everyone was really enthusiastic. Uh, we knew Gordon at Season of Mist for years because he actually, when he used to work at Relapse, and uh, he was the one that signed Abysmal Dawn to Relapse. They just seem like, in Europe at least, they seem like they have a larger setup than Relapse does. And, uh, yeah, I don't know, it just seemed like a good fit. It seems like, uh, from what I, with my understanding, is that the last few years... Uh were tumultuous and sort of there were there were moments that you might have had doubts about continuing the band and that sort of thing so uh you know, i'm glad you continued but uh what were some of the some of the trials that you went through over the last few years i don't know just a lot of different um i don't know we had lineup changes you know having i think the last record came out and we had a lot of high hopes for obsolescence and uh I felt a lot of stress, I think, from that record, and I felt like, I don't know, <clears throat> that I was doing the most, <laughs> carrying the brunt of the work between, like, whatever management and the, just, you know, having, um, writing most of the stuff for, or, you know, I don't know, even my mother passed away at the same time, we're doing that record, um, and then it's just kind of just, like, life-changing things, I guess, around that time. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It just in, internally, I think people weren't really getting along or, I don't know. I felt like a lot of people in the band didn't really want to be there and it felt like a lot of hired hands, you know, to be honest. And, and a lot of, I don't know, finger pointing when things weren't like perfect, I guess. <laughs> so I don't know. In the end, like it uh that changed and you know like the other guys went on to other projects you know we parted our ways um we had uh, james in the band <clears throat> he did a tour with us in 2016 with cannibal corpse obituary and cryptopsy that was the first um tour he did with us um he he just jumped into our set like on short notice about like a month and uh in advance and learned all our set and we just haven't really looked back since so we lucked out there and uh, we're happy to have him and you know he's it's it's good to be in a band with people like you get along with and are friends with and aren't just like business partners with basically you know um <clears throat> that's a tough tough thing to find and you know i there's bands that operate that way and it's fine but i think you know when you're at a certain level you really have to enjoy it or else it doesn't really make sense. You know, we're, we're a death metal band. We're not like a huge, I don't know. 
commercially viable band, you know, people aren't punching in and getting a paycheck and then, you know, living their, you know, <laughs> paying their house, their house mortgage or something. You know what I mean? You got to love what you do to do this. Um, and, uh, and we stuck it out and things have gotten better throughout the years. But I think, you know, after that, I think there was this personal stuff, uh, between, I think like all the members really, um, at the end. And I think we recorded the drums and rhythm guitars, um, all at, by November, December of what, 2017. And, uh, then just things went wrong and like our personal lives and stuff had to be taken care of. And <clears throat> we didn't have, uh, lyrics, uh, <sighs> lyrics or leads or bass lines written at the time. So things just kind of got drawn out. And since we're uh, doing everything out of my home studio, um, practically except for the drums, it just, I think people just thought they had more time than they, you know, <laughs> things just dragged along. Cause you know, they're like, ah, fuck. It's like, whatever. It's Charles's studio. You know, we got all the time in the world and you know, the season of mist was, not uh on our ass about anything we just wanted a good record at the end so we you know took our time and made sure we did that but that was basically it so the drummer on uh on phylogenesis is that a different drummer that's currently in the band right now yeah okay. yeah yeah, he's, yeah he's, this is straight. their first album yeah yeah scott plays for morbid angel now so mm -hmm. we have uh yes james is this is james's first record for us okay. yeah and i think that touring is probably uh that's like the the big hurdle that a lot of people have with doing this, you know, and staying yeah. passionate about it. And, you know, as you get older and you, you're, you do this for the years start racking up and, uh, you know, the financial rewards are not quite there and, uh, you know, it gets hard, you know, and, and was, was touring like that was, I'm assuming that was like <clears throat> a big, a big hurdle for a lot of people to, to get over. Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I know like Scott, for example, I know he wanted to be in a band that was like constantly active and touring or something that was going to like pay his bills out of music. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, we just weren't at that level at that time. And I think uh, things have definitely gotten better. Um, ironically, probably like right after he left, to be honest. Um, but, you know, we're still not like constantly on the road and that's not like the only thing we do we have day jobs right. you know <clears throat> so it's not it's not paying all the bills but it's lucrative enough like when we go on tour you know um and then they have some extra cash you know when when you come home which is good um but yeah i mean it's just that's just how it goes man i feel like there's usually uh, a guy or two in every band that like make the shit go around and then people that you know i mean no offense but are kind of long for the ride you know and uh they are to have the the fun <laughs> yeah which which is which is i mean it's cool i understand it and everyone's got to have their their uh their role and their purpose within the band you know so that, that's just the way it goes not everyone can be the captain captain of the ship either you know so but yeah. everyone's got to work together in some way and be understanding of their roles and you know that's that's just how it is yeah man been through a fair amount of members <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? What's up? but yeah you know like sometimes uh but also like i've been doing this for a long time and some some shit like people that left the band it's like dude we were young at the time you know like yeah some some of the guys you know popped up in other bands and we've since then like you know been cool or whatever and like talked about like shit from the past and everything was fine you know um it's just like dude you're just fucking kids man when you start in this shit <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you're definitely. getting in a van and you're like not you know under the ideal situations you know what i mean like uh i don't know but definitely it gets easier uh i think as you go along in certain ways you know <clears throat> like we haven't had a crowd in the van for a while which has been a huge bonus so yeah have you ever thought about not doing this at all i mean is that something that's ever crossed your mind i mean there was there was a time at the end of obsolescence where i was kind of like i don't we did 
like a U.S. tour, and then we did a European tour back to back. Um, and they were they were cool tours, man. Like don't get me wrong, like they they were good, but I, I don't know, just the just like the stupid fights and stuff at the time is just like man, like I I don't know. And then and then go to Europe, and I just felt like I didn't really get to enjoy it as much as I should have, you know, it was first time in Europe and. It just felt like more like a chore, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and like you know, like you, and you do projections or whatever to make, see what you know, like hoping you come home with a certain amount of money, and then you don't, and people are bitter about that, and it's like, dude, it's it's, it's can't really change anything, you know what I mean? And uh, I don't know, and then you come back, and then you're sick, and like you're playing shows on the way home. <laughs> from the u.s it was just a long one man and i think i was just thinking like fuck like why like why am i putting myself through this like what am i doing this for you know it felt more like uh starting to feel more like a job and i and i don't know i, I don't know like it, it, there needs to be some joy in it or else it's it's not worth it it's not just for you know some sort of monetary gain or something you know i think a lot of musicians do this because you know they want to have the, they enjoy like uh, creating or having some purpose rather than like I don't know like uh, then looking for joy in the uh, I don't know monetary value or like you know like having <clears throat> the nine to five or comfort of something. It's to, to feel like you're achieving something. Europe can definitely be one of those experiences where it's like the first maybe the first time you go over there is it's new and. You know, you're excited. Oh, look, I'm on a plane, you know, and you land and you're in Germany and it's cool. But like that can, those long European tours can be like brutal, you know, if, if you're not having a good time and if you're not in a good mindset and, you know, there's a language barrier. And if you start going further east, less and less people, there's that communication barriers. And then if you go really far east, there's even, you can't even make heads or tails out of what the signs read, you know, because they're in a, it's not a Latin based language. Like once you get to like Poland or something like that or Czech Republic and it's just like a really alienating feel. And if you're not having a good time, you can just really disappear down a rabbit hole, you know? Right. I mean, I think that's for any tour to be honest. There's always <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like there's always that fucking part where you like question your, your life choices <laughs> in, in the back of a fucking van or yeah, something, yeah. you know what I mean? In the middle of a tour. And like, that's not the time when you need to like do that, you know, just like get through it. You know, it's, you know, I like it to like going on tour to like a combination of like going camping and going to war kind of, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you have this, this experience where that can either like bring people together or like tear them apart. You know, it's a really interesting like social experiment when you think about it. Um, but yeah, I don't know, man, like Europe. So we did we did the U.S. for like three weeks, and I think we did Europe for three weeks, and then like a couple of shows coming home from uh, the U.S. And to be honest, I think the our European situation with the first time there, it was it was probably the most ideal thing we could have done. We were direct support on the direct uh, Death to All tour. Oh, okay, yeah. And you know, like we we were in a like a sprinter with bunks, and we had you know, um, and it were playing venues with catering and fucking, you know, uh, I, and, but like people were still complaining and I was like, Jesus Christ, I couldn't take it anymore. You know, to be honest, I just, I, yeah. Like after all that, it's like the most ideal situation you'd have. And people are still complaining about it. It's like, man, I just couldn't take it, you know? Um, <clears throat> but it is what it is. I don't know. You know, like, um, but I, I'm, I'm still glad we did those things and had that experience. And I'm glad we're here today. And like, you know, and, you know, people went their separate ways and are probably all happier because of it, you know? Yeah. I think that having that kind of thing go on is, is always, it just adds to the story, you know, the whole narrative of the band and just creates experiences. And, uh, and I, I kind of like when bands have like these kind of different eras, you know, within the career i mean because you guys have been around like like i don't know like 15 16 years or something like that you, you've been around for over over a decade 2000 
2003 is when we started, and then 2004 is like a first demo. First yeah. album, 2006. But yeah, man, it's been a while. And and that's like a really long time to keep a group of guys together, especially when you start out when you're such young guys, and you know a yeah. decade goes by, a decade and a half goes by, and you know people change and all that sort of stuff, and it's just a really long time. So. I don't know. I always find it interesting when you, you get, I mean, all of our favorite bands have had tons of lineup changes. I mean, you know, Napalm Death doesn't even have like this, there's three different Napalm Deaths you can make out of like all the <laughs> yeah, guys. No original dude. It's like no original members, you know, and you can <laughs> yeah, make yeah. like five different bands, you know? Yeah, man. You know, Morbid Angel, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, there's, there you can, all those bands have like a history and you can go through and see like, okay, this is the era we had this guy on guitar, you know, and I don't know, yeah. it's cool, you know, but, um, so during that period, is that when you opened up the studio during that, that lull between, uh, that interim period between obsolescence and, uh, phylogenesis? Yeah, basically, um, you know, it's a modest studio. I'm not going to lie. It's not like a fucking, um, uh, I don't, I can't, uh, I don't have a drum room, but you know, I can reamp guitars here and do everything else. Um, I do have an electronic drum kit, you know, for people that want to do that as well. Um, and the technology's gotten better, so it's not total shit anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so there's that. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I just kind of like, stumbled into that and just i guess i don't know in the downtime i i mean obsolescence kind of started like getting interested in recording and i've just picked up things along the way um from just you know down for the for all these years i guess of doing this and uh and then i just got the bug and i just like totally immersed myself in it i guess <laughs> and uh yeah i was kind of focused on that too you know in the downtime is really getting into recording and every aspect of that and acquiring gear and all that. So do you have any formal background recording or is it something you just kind of learned on the fly? Like a lot of, a lot of people do that honestly these days is uh, it's not like back in the day where you had this, you had to basically have an, a degree in electrical engineering to become like a recording engineer. Yeah, no, I don't have a degree or anything like that. I didn't go to school for it. I mean, it's all basically, um, self-taught and learning stuff online. And, um, I know like, uh, I friend Al who does the, like nail the mix stuff. Um, he introduced me to his website, like whenever they were first starting, we toured, I toured with his band Doth in like 2008, I think it was mm -hmm. 2008. And, uh, but anyway, he does this thing called nail the mix and, uh, URM Academy stuff. And, when, whenever they started, uh, he hooked me up to try out. And um, I, I think from then I just kind of like really got the bug and and that helped expand upon uh, whatever knowledge I had at the time, you know. And then just learning from, you know, the guys that we've recorded with over the years, where it's Mike Bear or John Haddad. Um, yeah, and just hands-on experience from doing it for so long, you know, and stuff you picked up along the way. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. So yeah. That probably offers you a lot of freedom, even, even just in writing, like you could probably demo everything like to the, to the very detailed degree, yeah. I imagine, you know? Yeah. In obsolescence, we demoed a, lo a lot of the record or we demoed the whole record. Um, it's me at home. And, uh, cause we didn't really get to jam, from very much at all on that album um there was like a handful of times that we got together and then some of those jam sessions i would take home and try and piece together and then program drums and then even like work off stuff that maybe scott um started on idea or something you know when and uh <clears throat> this this album though um you know i had a drummer that lived here and we were able to like write stuff together and uh i got an electronic drum kit so we could jam stuff you know in my studio because like i don't i don't know like california isn't big on basements you know what i mean yeah <laughs> so you kind of have to like make it work somehow um but uh yeah i mean it definitely helped um 
and piecing together the record and demoing all the stuff until we got it right, you know? Do you play drums at all? Because uh, you were talking about programming and demos. Do you demo with software or do you like tap out some drum tracks or how, how do you handle <clears throat> that when you do the writing? Uh, well, I mean, at first, I st when, before James joined, I started writing stuff uh, with a just program programming like MIDI drums, mm -hmm. you know, um, and using samples. And but like once he got in the band, you know, he would come over. We had an electronic drum kit. Um, he would play something, you know, track all the MIDI and and uh, my DAW, whatever recording program, and then. <clears throat> And then just piece stuff together like that. Or he he'll also like knows how to like write out drums and and program MIDI too. So like I would take his stuff and like and if we, we liked something somewhere else or maybe like change something in his that he played, um, we would do it and and then he would fuck with it later. Um but yeah, I mean, I, I program a little bit of drums. I'm a shitty drummer, but I can play like a beat, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I'm not, I'm not the best, uh, at grind beats or something. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sick at like, you know, uh, Paul Rudd and like, you know, bolt thrower beats, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the thing about playing fast and, uh, you know, doing technical music, like what you guys do, um. You know, you might be able to lay down like a four four like A C D C beat, but that's just not gonna cut it really in this right, type of Hold on, music. let me correct myself. I said Paul Rudd, not Phil Rudd. You mean Phil Rudd, yeah. That's <laughs> I picked up on that, man. That's what I was saying. Like he slap as the bass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh you ever play around with easy drummer or uh superior drummer? It's um pretty pretty amazing program, which I use a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, makes makes demoing and stuff. You can do the whole thing basically just in your your apartment, you know. Because right, yeah. No, I uh, I I had I guess on obsolescence I had a drum kit from Hell, I think. Yeah, yeah. And then on this record, I was using the SSD four, and I upgraded to SSD five, the Steven Slate drums. Like after, um, they just integrate good with the I don't know the the drum module that I'm run, running in the the um, the MIDI MIDI drums and all that. Yeah, I'm always interested to hear how other people do this kind of stuff, just because um, you know some bands are all about just playing together in a room. But it sounds like you have you're probably or were at least in a similar situation where none of the guys lived locally, but now now you have a drummer that lives in town, so it's a little bit easier. Yeah, because some of the co coolest shit comes out of the jam sessions, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you don't have that. It just, I, I don't know. It, I, it's not terrible, but I feel like it misses something sometimes or just, you know, those uh, um, the synchronicities of just playing together sometimes. It's funny to think back to, um, I mean, I, I don't know. Are you, a, are you a 70s rock fan i mean no i know you like acdc because you mentioned phil rudd but <laughs> do you uh obviously i'm assuming you like sabbath and zeppelin and stuff like that you know yeah yeah man and what's crazy is to think about how those guys recorded how it was like zeppelin oh, was kind of just like the band in a room <clears throat> really you know what i mean yeah but even some of those you know crazy production albums you know or like where it's like Dark Side of the Moon or like Night of the Opera or something. And you think about like how they track that and how, you know, they had to mix it by hand and, you know what I mean? Like the little automations and shit. Uh -huh. Like that's fucking amazing to me. Like, and, and like, uh, I mean, they're not playing maybe as tech as stuff, but it's still, it's like, man, that was, that was like, at least play, people fucking like, didn't punch in like a million fucking times and you know what I mean? Yeah. Like really played that shit, which is fucking great, you know? Well, well, a testament to that is like live records too, man. Like back in the seventies, I feel like bands, every band had the, the live album. You know what I mean? There was like, yeah, the song, I mean, it's the same for Zeppelin. Like Sabbath had a couple of live records out there. Kiss had, you know, kiss alive one and two, you know, and, and, you know, I, I later on, I guess I found out that I think maybe the Thin Lizzy live album might have been like doctored up a bit, but 
at the end of the day, that's what the band sounds like. And it's pretty amazing if you think about, and, and you think about how you, you hear live recordings now and it's like, it's kind of like different. You know what I mean? I thought Kiss Alive was bullshit. I thought that was in the, in well, the well, city. That's, that was one of the, I, one of the things I found out that it was bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like, I know the Thin Lizzy one too. I, I heard part of that was doctored a little bit, but the Kiss Alive stuff is definitely not real. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, it's that, that Slayer record too. Um, I mean, that's eighties, but it was the, the first, the first live album, not decade of aggression, but, uh, there's one in the studio too, I think. I oh yeah. Well, that's not, that's not them live. That's like some studio trickery. No, 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 Decade of Aggression is is live. Okay. I don't think I don't think you could ever say that it isn't live. That's raw as fuck. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I was like, damn, they could have did a better job doctoring it up. Better I was job, like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Um, but yeah, man. With this new record, uh, so that was done over a long period of time. So you said you did the drums earlier, and then you guys there was like a lull, and then you went back and finished the record, and. Uh, do you find like lyric writing to be the worst part of the of the of making an album at all? Dude, I fucking hate it. <laughs> I, like I'm so fucking over it, man. Like I think, uh, you know, like for this album, because at cer- a certain point, and I guess that's part of the reason this takes a while. And uh, uh, <clears throat> it's like you, you know you run out of shit to say. Yeah. And I feel like you need to like wait and let life happen in order for you to like, kind of like reload your ammo on shit to say. Um, and you know, enough life happened to me that like I had shit to say basically on this record. Um, and it's hard. I mean, I think when we first started, I was thinking about doing a concept record and, um, I don't know. I had this whole idea about it, like super nerdy fucking, you know, like, sci-fi sort of like concept album for it and like and i started it and uh and i just had like no emotional co- connection to it i felt like i was like you know reading off like scientific facts or some bullshit and yeah. it just it just didn't feel like right so i scrapped that idea and just started like sort of like you know scrawling shit from the heart and or you know um and and then concepts would sort of come based out of that. And yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, lyrics are tough, man. And, uh, and I feel like for me, I usually go to like sort of a dark place for it. And when you're not in a good place already at a particular time, it's, it's not fun. Yeah, <laughs> no, it, totally. it took, it, it took a, uh, yeah, I like by the en- end of like recording the vocals and like, you know, writing all the lyrics, I was pretty much done like mentally. Like I wasn't wasn't in a good place. So <clears throat> so finally being done with it, I mean, yeah, it was a huge relief, I guess. When it was so, yeah. Now, do you keep up uh, like a notebook that you work off of or like when you do you just decide, okay, now it's time to write lyrics or is it something that you kind of chip away at over time? Cause, uh, yeah, once again, I'm always interested to hear how people do it. Cause everyone seems to do it differently. I don't know. I think my process like changes for every record. I mean, for this album, I did try and take like a bunch of notes of like, if, if I thought of something I thought would be cool or if I heard like, I don't know, like a, bit of inspiring poetry or something or like or or just words that i like the sound of because i just like the sound of words sometimes you know yeah. um yeah i'd write it down and have like a sheet i would go back to and consult as i went went along um but yeah man i don't know like at the end of the day i think i i did just sort of uh um, demo, like make a bunch of noises and words that I thought like, um, made sense, like off the top of my head. Yeah. And then, and then sort of like go back and like make sense of things and like rewrite stuff and, um, but have like the sense of at least the, the vocal patterns before I went to work on writing the actual lyrics. So. Yeah. A lot of people do that actually. I mean, that's, um, I think there was like, 
you can find online like some kind of like James Hetfield vocal pattern recordings of some Metallica songs. And, uh, you know, a lot, I, I know most, I, I do the same thing. I'll, I'll record versions of just like the sounds of what I want it to sound like with a demo and then use that as like a template to kind of fit the words together. I think that's a, a pretty useful technique, you know? Yeah, man, totally. It definitely, definitely helps. So you, originally you said you wanted, you were thinking about doing some kind of concept record, but at the end of the day, looking back on your lyrics, did you, do you see any kind of overarching theme between all the songs? Uh, yeah. I mean, I feel like it, it sort of inadvertently became a concept album in a way. Cause I feel like, uh, the lyrics, I, I don't know. I feel like, you know, uh, wasn't doing the best mentally. And I feel like everything sort of ties into, I think how like modern society can drive you insane in some way in different aspects of different things. So, I don't know. It almost it was almost like the soundtrack to like falling apart. <laughs> yeah. Like at the time, you know? Um, and like the, the title Phylogenesis is sort of meant to be it could be considered like just as it is, like an evolution, I guess, for like the band. Or it can be considered more like a a, a negative thing and like how we've de de evolved as a society. And uh so yeah, I mean it, it has some sort of concept tied into it like inadvertently so i don't know yeah i was going to ask you about the title because uh i couldn't quite decipher what that uh if there was a meaning behind that or anything yeah so uh specifically with the de-evolution of society like what, what are some of the things that you see in society that are uh that are on the brink of collapse I don't know. I mean, I just feel like with, you know, like social media and stuff like that, I, we just feel more disconnected than ever, but still like everyone is connected and everyone's got a voice. Everyone's, you know, screaming at, over each other at the same goddamn time. Like no one's like has like a, I don't know, a dialogue where they sit, sit down and talk about things intelligently. They just, you know, everyone's shouting their opinion over each other. Everyone's, everyone's bringing their own life narrative into, you know, their, their objectives or how they see society and what they want. And, and I understand that, but I also feel like people aren't open-minded enough to, I don't know, um, see shit from other people's perspectives. And I think that's always changing things and we should be open to like, dialogue and i feel like that's not a thing anymore everyone and on any side of whatever political spectrum or belief system you're on like everyone's just like nope fuck you this is you know this is what i believe or this is you know <laughs> like there's no no open dialogue or you know um reason with people anymore and i think that's really bothered me over these past few years um yeah yeah, I feel like that's escalated, man. And and at some point, um, socially, yeah, I feel like there's going to be some kind of like uh, climax that's going to happen eventually, just between all these people shouting at each other virtually. Um, yeah, you know, it's ironically. I mean, you know, it used to be, you know, pro being progressive used to mean that you had an open mind to other ideas and you were tolerant and. Nowadays, it seems like it just means that you have to be tolerant in a very specific way and that. Right. Which is fucking retarded. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. Like it's, it's almost so you like. You gotta you know, be being... tolerant of everyone's stupid fucking feelings. Like, come on, man. <laughs> like, I mean, yes, sure. You can be to tolerant, but like not everyone. You can't. I don't know, man. Like er, you got to like watch walk around eggshells of, for everything. The afraid that. You're going to hurt someone's feelings when maybe you're fucking right about something, you know, or you or you can you can't have a discussion about it because that hurts your feelings like grow the fuck up, man. Like, really, like, seriously, like, I can't stand that. Like, people need to grow up like life is not going to like bend to your will to make you comfortable. You know, I don't know where that fucking came from, but it needs to stop. Like, seriously, you know.
Yeah, I agree, man. That's that's like the worst. And uh, I mean, you know, like most people listen to this this uh, podcast, and you know, me and you, and every, you know, we got into extreme music because we wanted to push things. You know what I mean? And and like the music and the art and you know, movies, literature, like comic books, like whatever horror films. It's because we were into extreme shit, and that resonated with us on some level. And being offended is it's like okay if you're offended then this isn't for you but you still were you you can live and let live and now it's like that's just off the table like you have to adhere right. and comply with everything and that's the fucking worst yeah. that's ridiculous man. <clears throat> you know if if someone is you know yeah it's like someone is offended about a movie or something and like they watch the movie and then they're offended about it. And it's like, you could have not watched the movie. You could have turned it off. You could have left the theater or whatever it is, you know, like, I, I don't know. But then it becomes a, uh, I don't know, just as an example, you know what I mean? I just, I don't understand how, why people think that everyone else is responsible to make them feel comfortable about everything. I just don't get it. But the one, the one thing that gives me solace, though, is... Uh, did you see the Joker film that came out last year? Oh, yeah, man. It's fucking yeah, great. Great. Loved it. And yeah. the, the one solace I get is that that movie kicked up so much controversy and it was like, you know, this like, uh, you know, eulogy for the right wing or whatever that some people saw it as this like right wing, uh, you know, male kind of trip, you know, it, However, as a, despite all that, the movie like totally killed it at the box office and tons of people yeah. saw it and it won a fucking some kind of a, you know, like a movie award, like a, I don't know, fucking Golden Globe or some shit. But how is that like a right wing movie? That's the thing is like, <laughs> there's so many fucking, that's what I mean, man. Yeah. Like there's so many things like that where like, I don't know, like I used to think I was like kind of liberal, but now like I, uh, I don't know, like to what people think liberal is or how liberals act or, you know what I mean? Like not to get too fucking into politics, but like, like I realize I, I'm, I think I'm kind of middle of the road or I like, or I don't know, just, I'm not, I don't like what I, any of these people are fucking saying, like on either side, yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and like, I just wish we could get back to like, I don't know, like using logic and reason. I don't know. Yeah. Like saying Joker is a, uh, some sort of right wing tool that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Like, what is that? I mean, if I think if that movie had come out like 10 years ago, you know, it'd be seen as like what it is like this art piece and about someone basically like what I was saying, but I, you know, I saw that movie after her album was done and, and it was kind of like encompassing sort of the, the things I was feeling at the time. It's just like how society and people are just like not taking care of each other and just driving people crazy, you know? Um, he He's sort of an anti-hero hero in the movie. And like you don't, I don't know, when you watch that, I, I don't, I know it's dangerous to like maybe to say that you you feel for him or understand, but you do <laughs> you know like society creates these people you know what i mean and everyone has their own path but you still empathize for that person when you know that maybe you were at one point a step away from being you know losing your shit too you know so that's that i don't know i yeah <laughs> well that that's the real uh beauty of that film is because there is a characteristic in that you know, in the Joker character that people empathize with. However, most people don't take that step into becoming a psychopath and murdering people. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, and, he's also like mentally, exactly. like he's got mental problems. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, I, I, I so again, that I have to say is a right wing movie because basically that's like, uh, you know, uh, advocating probably for like social programs and taking yeah. care of, people you know i mean how is that a right wing like <laughs> propaganda yeah. I don't get well, well i think it's pretty clear that one of the messages in the movie is that there isn't the, the fact that you know people with mental you know illness mental illness in general is being ignored in this country and and he's a victim of that 
you know, and I think, yeah. and that's what I loved about the movie is there's so, it's like for, for every point, there's like a counterpoint, you know, and, right. you know, and it's, um, I think that people are going to look back on this film and also look back at the time in which it was made. And it's going to be things that people are going to talk about in, you know, film classes, I think, you know, yeah. in my opinion, at least, but there's other movies like that have been made, you know, that I, that I appreciate, you know, like whether it's like a taxi driver, like falling down or something yeah. like that, you know? Well, I was going to bring that up about taxi driver because it's funny that uh, that film and cruising and a lot, a lot of these like films from the seventies are, uh, or, or came out amidst a lot of controversy. You know what I mean? Like taxi yeah. driver was initially the first cut of that film was given an X ratings for violence. Yeah. So it's not, it's nothing new, you know, any, everyone out there writing in blogs about, you know, how, this is, uh, you know, a uh, indication of the decay of our society or whatever. It's like, well, you know, Martin Scorsese made a film like 30 something years ago, almost almost 50 years ago about, you know, the same goddamn thing. And there was always some jackass writing about how it was like this antisocial statement or whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's dude, the uh, the 70s, probably the best time for film. To oh, be I honest. agree. I mean, like, you know. Yeah. They were just pushing, pushing the envelope in so many different ways. And, you know, there's some movies out there. I, I, I don't know, like I wish people like knew more about or, you know, or have, uh, like, I don't know. You ever see that movie devils? You ever seen that one? Devils? No. Yeah. Check that out. Um, what was it like Vanessa Redgrave, uh, Oliver Platt, right? Okay. He's like the, yeah. Um, <clears throat> check that movie out. I mean, that was a movie that came out in the seventies and was fucking torn to pieces because of its religious content and how offensive it was. But dude, it's beautiful movie. Like, uh, I have a edition that's like pieced together from like, I don't know, like, uh, lost footage and. I don't know, but it's something that I think like Warner brothers won't even release. Cause it was so fucking offensive. Oh, wow. There's like, there's like nuns like, <laughs> um, going wild and like raping a statue of Christ. And <laughs> it's right up my alley, but, man. This is great. Yeah. But you know what though? Like it's, I hate it's done in the most tasteful way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know as possible as you can. It's a Ken Russell movie, if you know that. Yeah, is. I know Ken Russell is. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So I think that's like his best movie, man. And like, it, didn't and it's he do, really uh, just about like a? I could compare it to like, you know, any other sort of movie, like a Braveheart or something, like or a Christ-like figure, like dying for what they believe in and and being persecuted for, or even like, yeah, you know, like. uh I don't know, like, uh, what, what's that, um, movie about the Salem witch trials or whatever, <clears throat> or play rather. It's kind of like that too. Just a person like falsely accused to get out of the way for big government and all that. So I mean, I highly recommend it if you, if you can find yeah. it. Ken Russell did uh, altered States too, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's another okay. great movie. Yeah, there's a lot. Of, that was a thing in the '70s, I think, because um, even uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, the uh, Sam Peckinpah film, there's a there's like a kind of a, a vaguely anti-government, anti-business uh, sentiment in that film as well, too. Yeah, man. I mean, there's a lot. Yeah, a lot of the movies from the '70s are like Network. Yeah, Network. Mm -hmm. If you watch that shit, dude, it's still relevant today. You know, spelt it all out a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> so yeah. Good time for movies. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, once again, it's like offensiveness, all this stuff. It's I just wish people would, would be able to see beyond their own weird, like whatever, whatever trips they have about hang ups about certain things. You know, it's just it cuts you cuts you off from like a whole world of other things you could be experiencing. You know, I mean, yeah. even, you know, even extreme music, it's like when I first was a kid, you know, and like the heaviest thing I heard was like maybe Sabbath and Zeppelin and then slowly you start getting into stuff. And, you know, I heard like Black Flag and I was like, I don't, I didn't even like it when I first heard it because it sounded just like noise. But 
yeah and, you know had offensive you know slip it in album cover and all this stuff and then you know i got into like gg allen and all and that's super offensive you know but then you i don't know that you start seeing the validity in everything you know and yeah you know even even some writers like george bataille like people like that you know who you know were blasphemous and you know pasolini was like killed because of his you know he offended people with his film you know and and it's um who's pasolini um uh, sodom 100 days of oh, he salo? Days okay, of, okay. Of sodom yeah, yeah, and yeah, salo yeah. yeah and uh yeah. you know he was um under a lot of fire but you know even that film that's a hard film to watch man but there's a like once it's, you it's get a fuck- I'm sorry. There's a fucking Criterion edition of that. Though. Yeah. You know that? <laughs> exactly. There is. <laughs> like, I know it, that. It is like people, pe- it is a part of film history. Like, you know, that some of these movies are, um, you know, touted as trash and they're like, you know, or just art that, you know, is, comes out and people think is trash and then later is touted as, you know, like a, a milestone. Well, so. it's like the people now that are, you know, they're blogging about all this stuff. I think in, in historically, as time goes by, they're going to be like the church ladies who, you know, refuse to, you know, being offended by everything. You know, they're going to be the ones who are like the, the bum outs who stood in the way of everybody having a good time. You know, they're not going to be helping culture <clears throat> at all, I think, you know. Yeah. I mean, let me ask you this. I don't know. I want to get your opinion on this. Yeah. What what about all right? So how do you feel? Um, uh, uh, can you separate the artist from like their personal beliefs and their music or like things they've done? I guess or or an or an artist, not not necessarily music, just an artist in general. Hundred percent, yes. Because yeah. there's tons of writers that I have that are awful people, like Norman Norman Mailer who's like yeah. celebrated as a journalist was like a horrible person in real life, you know? And it's like, you know, composers, you know, like I, I definitely, I mean, you, you have to, and some of the nicest people I know make the worst music. So what are you going to do? You know? <laughs> yeah. Like the converse has to be true too. Just cause you're yeah, a nice right. guy doesn't mean you make good music. Sometimes your music sucks and you're like the best guy in the world. Yeah. I mean, I'm not condoning, you know, actions of people or, or whatever. I mean, saying that murder is okay or, or whatever else, you know, I mean, there's certain things that probably, you know, you have to draw the line at, you know, your own personal beliefs or whatever. But yeah, dude, some, some of them are really hard, you know, cause like, I, I don't know, just certain artists were like, fuck man, like I love their music and or their their writing or their their movies or whatever, but like fuck, why do they be such a shitty person or why do they have to do that? I f- I don't know, man. Like I feel like there there will be no art, there will be no like evolution of things if we shut out like all that. If we sh- if we condemn everyone that's ever done anything remotely shitty, you know, and and abandon their work completely, like just. I, for judging them on their own character and like i i know it sucks but yeah man like i i just can't do it i i can't like I, there's there's people i don't like but i fucking like their music you know um i'm not gonna i don't know i just i don't get that at all either yeah i mean i have like a live and let live vibe about all this stuff too because if someone you know everyone's different if someone is so offended by someone's actions that they can't appreciate their work, then yeah, that that's good for you. You know, that's I'll, I'll respect that, and I think that's like your your choice, and that's fine. But don't condemn me because I have a different level of tolerance for something. You know what I mean? Like I think that that these are all personal decisions, and maybe you might think, well, you know, this guy's got like issues himself. Maybe I do. Maybe I. Maybe I. Maybe I'm damaged as a person too. You know, but Fucking also, everyone is, and that's what I mean. It's like <laughs> that. Maybe that does say something about me. Yeah. You know, but uh, I'm not going to throw away an entire career of work for you know these transgressions that happen because at at the end of the day, you know, a lot of that stuff's going to be forgotten about some of these people. You know, and yeah. what's going to remain after they pass from this mortal coil is the, what the the legacy of their work is going to remain, you know, and that's what you have to look at, you know. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, 
I don't know. Well, thank you for sharing your opinion on that one. Yeah, man. You know, of course. Now, um, I would I would ask you what you guys have coming up, but since we're all uh, under quarantine, uh, I, I'm assuming there's probably uh, that's uncertain at this point. Yeah, I mean, we were gonna try and be on the on the road again in June, and then uh, that got shot down. So now. I don't know. Um, I'm currently mixing a record for a band called Beyond Grace from the UK. And uh, when that's done, I'm probably going to go. We had some songs that were left over from the last record that we recorded, just mm -hmm. never recorded uh, lyrics or vocals. So we might um, work on an EP or have those songs like released some way, you know. Um, but yeah, that's basically what we got going on right now maybe we'll start right working on the next record who knows you know are is it uh you know you, is it easy for you guys to get together with all this uh social distancing and all that kind of stuff i mean we can do whatever the fuck we want yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you know what i mean <laughs> i mean it's not it's not uh recommended yeah you know it's like the speed limit in Los Angeles. It's oh, there there's a suggestion. Yeah, I like that. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. There's a suggestion, but like people are, you know, still not gonna follow the rules. <laughs> but like, no, but like, you sh in all seriousness, like everyone should. You know, like I, I don't know, like how much we're gonna get together and to see those guys. Uh, you know, in, in this downtime. Um. But you know, we'll we'll see. But we're everyone's you know, locked up right now, trying to keep to themselves. And I think when we have free time, we'll discuss how we want to handle things. And, um, yeah, you see, I'll like de louse everyone that comes over. <laughs> and shit, you know? Yeah, man. The, the one thing that gives me solace is that everyone is dead in the water right now. It's not like I'm missing out on anything or we're like, you know, I don't know. It's sometimes you get that feeling like, man, should we be doing something more? Are we doing enough or whatever? And it's like, no one's touring right now. And that's kind of the way it's going to be for a little bit. So, you know, if that's yeah, like man, dude, like, honestly, this is, it's scary because you think about like sort of what a fragile state the music industry has been in for a long time. Yeah. And, and to have something like this come along and nearly like torpedo the whole fucking ship, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's fucking weird, man. Like everyone, like no one can do anything, you know. Um, everyone's got to become a fucking bedroom guitar player, like fucking, you know, like YouTube social media whore in the meantime, which which sucks, you know, because for certain bands, you know, that's not our thing. Yeah, you know? definitely not my thing. <laughs> you know, yeah. so um, and you know, so people do that just fine and I, i'm just i'm sorry i know it sounds like i'm knocking it like i know like times are changing and people need to do different things to like stay afloat and adapt or die and all that you know it's just certain things i just i don't want to like stoop stoop to you know like i just it's not part of my personality so i don't want to fucking do it you know i think I, I don't know like i said hopefully uh when this all eventually gets straightened out uh, people appreciate it more you know that's what i'm hoping for yeah, me too, man. We'll see. Well, thanks, Charles. I appreciate it uh, taking the time out. And um, yeah, man, hope to see you soon, man. Hopefully, we get all, get through this real quickly and uh, get to see you guys out there on the road again. Cool, man. Thanks a lot. All right, take man. care, man. All right, have a good night. All right, you too. Peace. <laughs> episode of Metal Matters, the Guinea Radio Weekly Podcast. Tune in next week and see what we have in store for you. The show is available on all streaming platforms, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, etc. Also, be sure to check out Gimme Radio, streaming on the web, iOS, or Android. For one of the best metal communities, exclusive merch, interviews with artists, and so much more. I'll catch you guys next week. Take care. I'll do a final run of the Lancaster Park.